morning. Welcome to worship. Um, just have a few announcements to get things started. Um, first, I just ask that you pass the friendship register down the pew and um, introduce those that may be sitting around you that you may not know. We will be having a Wednesday evening Linton study um, starting March 19th. This week, because of spring break and the mission trip, um, we won't be meeting, but the week after, starting at 5.30 with a snack supper, and it will conclude around 6.45. If you are planning to attend that, go ahead and make a note in the Friendship Register of how many people will be attending. That would be great. We also have a position for a nursery assistant available. Um, more details are on our website, but if you know of anyone who might be interested, um, please have them either call the office or check out the website and apply um, online. And it is also time to sign up for the fellowship time refreshments. There's a sign up in the parlor, so if you are interested in uh, doing that, please sign up. And then also, just a quick note in your bulletin, you'll notice through Lent that we will be having um, a confession of faith and words of assurance. So I just wanted to point that out. That will go through, um, through the Lenten season. And that's all we have for today. Let's enjoy uh, our morning's prayer. <laughs> to strengthen our faith. We are a to people. Let us worship God together.
God, we are grateful that we still have faith. grace without limit. God walks with us, guides us, and teaches us all we need for abundant life. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. It's time for children's moment. forgot this important thing. You know what this important thing is? Yeah. Why is it important? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going did you have trouble getting up this morning by any chance, anybody? <laughs> oh, you did. Sometimes it's tempting to stay in bed, isn't it? Well, we're going to talk about a big word today. And that word... <coughs> is, here it is, are you ready? Say it a little louder. Temptation. Temptation, yes. Would you hold that for me, Griffin? Temptation. What is temptation? When you want to do something, but you don't do it, I guess. You're close. It's when you want to do something that you know you shouldn't do. That's temptation. Let me give you an example. If you have homework due tomorrow, and, it, and you need to spend some time to get it done, but your favorite program is on television, that's temptation. Because you're thinking, I'd really like to watch my program, but I can watch my program first and then do my homework, but you know you don't have time to do both. That's temptation. Now, if you do what you should do, what do you, you resist temptation, and what do you do? Do your homework, absolutely. However, if you give in to temptation, what are you going to do? Watch TV instead of homework? Absolutely. So, if we give in, is that the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? And if you resist temptation, is that the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? The right thing to do. Good. Now, do you think Jesus was ever tempted? Do you think he was? The Bible tells us Jesus was tempted just like you and I are. But he never sinned. He never sinned. How, what was it that kept Jesus from giving in to temptation? What could have helped him? Any ideas, Drew? Any ideas what, what might have kept him from sinning or giving in to temptation? Ah, <laughs> well, it was God and God's word that kept him from giving in to temptation. God helped him, and God's word helped him because he knew, he knew from the scriptures what he was supposed to do. Do we have God's word? 
<laughs> no, yes. Where do we have God's word? Yeah, in the Bible. In the Bible is absolutely right. So when you, we are all tempted all the time. So if you or I are tempted, if we remember and stop and think, we can do the same thing Jesus did. We can resist if we think about what? <coughs> God will help us. And his word will help us. I've got something that might help us remember. I want to say something, and I want you to say it after me, okay? We can, we can resist, resist temptation, temptation with, God's word. with God's word. All right, let's try that again. We can, we can resist, resist temptation, temptation with God's word. With All right, there's something else that can help you an awful lot. You know what that is? That's going to help you to help you to resist temptation. Say a little prayer. You can say it in your head. You can say it out loud. Say, dear God, help me do the right thing. Help me do the right thing. And try to remember something that maybe you've read in the Bible that will help you do the right thing. Okay? Now, before, after our prayer, I have a little paper over there on the end of the pew, first pew. You can take it with you on your way to Children's Church or back. It has a coloring page and some puzzles in there. You can work on and they're all about temptation so will you pray with me please i have there it is put it right beside me <coughs> pray with me please dear heavenly father bless these children with all their energy and all their knowledge we are so thankful for your holy word help us to study and learn what it teaches so that we all will be able to resist temptation to do wrong in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. list of prayer concerns, but in the midst of some of those concerns, we have some joys, and some of those joys are sitting right in this room, even as we speak. We will start with Janelle Shaw, but she's been gone for a little while, taking care of her mom, Joanne May, who is now in Canton, in a nursing home, and doing some rehab, and getting herself ready to go home. She spent her 85th? 80th birthday in the hospital. That is no fun, but she is doing better and moving forward. Some ups and downs, but moving forward. And so Janelle, welcome home. We're glad that you're home. May you get some good rest so that when your mom goes home, you can go and take good care of her again, which you have already been doing. I know that you appreciate the prayers of this congregation that have been um, uh, with you. Uh, we celebrate that Jeff Bennett, who is not here today because he's in a cast, wrong arm, it's the left arm, but um, he's in a cast at home, and it's kind of bulky and awkward, so he just stayed home today. But his surgery went well on Wednesday. And so, Teresa, for you, because now you must be doing everything. If he can't move that arm, things haven't changed much. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> and so, uh, see, he's not here. I can get away with that, and he doesn't even know. So, um, but we keep you in our prayers, and we celebrate that the surgery has gone well. Roma Pendle is here with us this morning. Um, I visited her on Thursday, and she was in ICU, and here she is on Sunday. Thanks be to God, right, Roma? Right. And so um, we're glad that you are here and with us and doing well, and you spent your birthday in the hospital also, didn't you? Yes, I did. What I birthday was? Was that your 39th birthday? Well, a little bit of that. All right. <laughs> Um, and then one more thing to celebrate, Gail Randall, who has been um, hobbled a little bit these last few weeks um, with a fall, but doing better and able to be with us this Sunday. Thankfully, it didn't snow, so you could get here without being worried. I'm um, hopeful for your continued healing, but so grateful that you are able to join us today. Let us all just say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Um, 
we do have some um, more concerns. Uh, Katie is here with her mother, but her husband is still in the hospital and is due to be in the hospital at least until Tuesday with uh, possible surgery um, to come. And so we will keep David Kerr in our prayers. And Katie, I don't know how you're doing it, but you must have the strength of a hundred women. And um, I admire you for all that you're going through right now. And we just keep you in our prayers as well. Uh, let's see, Gene Cooper is going tomorrow, and he will be in St. Louis. He is uh, going to start his treatment for his acute leukemia and is uh, grateful for any interaction from anyone, and, uh, but they will be gone for about a week. That's going to be their schedule. They'll be gone a week and then home for some time and then gone for a week. Each time they go to St. Louis, they'll be down there for several days. And so they are anxious to get started with treatment. And so help us, uh, let us help them with our prayers. And we are hopeful that the treatment will do what it's supposed to do and help David, uh, I'm sorry, help um, Jean get into remission. Alexis Muneer will leave on Tuesday morning to go to Peoria for some testing and maybe a procedure, so Joe will keep you and family in prayer as that goes well, we hope. Alexis is our little girl up here who likes to find Joe wherever he is. Where is that? Where is that? Um, we got good news about a man who's been on our prayer list, Jerry Crable, and uh, he went to Mayo to have some testing done and has heard that there is no more cancer at the moment. And so that is good news, and he is celebrating that, and we will celebrate right along with him. Uh, a friend of Risa Deal, uh, Vicki Fosdick, is in Peoria, is that right? And not doing well. And so we will keep Vicki and her family in our prayer, and her friends in our prayers as she goes through this very difficult time. I would mention also Betty Sherwood. Many of you who are part of the prayer chain know that Betty had a heart attack. And, um, and then the next day was diagnosed with AFib and also pneumonia. Uh, she had a, a very successful surgery to um, put in a stent in the artery that was 100% blocked. Uh, she um, is doing well, but is only has a little energy to time. The pneumonia, I think, is as difficult for her as anything right now. She's hoping to get beyond the pneumonia so that she can get her energy back so that she can um, get down the healing process. The doctor said, I will see you in two weeks. And she's like, I don't live here. And he's like, will you do now? <laughs> so she will be staying for at least two more weeks um, with her daughter as she heals. And uh, as soon as she gets out of the hospital, we'll let you know that, of course. But uh, she'll be there for at least a couple more days, I would assume. Um, don't know that with any assurance, but just assume that it's going to take a few more days for the pneumonia to go away and get her into the rehab that she needs for her heart. This afternoon, there are some of us getting ready for a mission trip, and even though some of us may not come until Tuesday, um, we are in this space, and so I'm going to ask for those who are going on a mission trip to please stand up. We have Rod and Ellen, Jan, Nodine, maybe. Oh, that's no good. Maybe you can come on Tuesday with Ellen. <laughs> and your husband, Ted, is coming. And then we have two high school students who aren't in the room who are also coming. And so, um, and then I'm going on that trip too. So please keep the um, eight of us in your prayers that as we go and represent your um, church in Washington, Illinois, that we can bring back news of hope and growth, even in the midst of difficulty and struggle. We are excited to go and do whatever they will have us do. There's very little rebuilding going on in Washington at this point. Um, the rebuilding that is happening is for those who had good enough insurance that they could get it started. But there are many people who are still cleaning up. I spoke with someone on the phone um, just this morning even, and she was talking about how people had kind of given up, that the winter was too harsh. They haven't even cleared out their basements because it was just too much to even try to tackle with the kind of winter that we've had. And, and people are, um, well, their spirits are in tough places. So we will go and we will clean up and we'll clear fields and we'll clean basements and whatever we can do, we will do. And hopefully we can bring um, a small light into what has been a dark period in the people's lives of Washington. So please keep um, those of us going on this mission trip in your prayers. Many things 
to pray about, and I'm sure that we have not mentioned all of them. So as we go into our morning prayer, let us center ourselves, breathe, connect with our God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, for those who have joy and hope, we are grateful. For those in need of your help, your care, your health, your comfort, we lift up. We know that not all prayer concerns have been mentioned this day, but you know our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Hear the words which may not have been spoken. Hear the names that we have not heard. But in your infinite presence, you already know. In the season of the church, we've entered that time called Lent. Forty days to connect with you. 40 days to be more connected to your Son. Help us to try to live in his footsteps. Help us in these next few weeks to hear again his stories, to hear again your presence in the midst of difficulties, to hear again how we are to live our lives, to hear again the good news. The good news that you went out in every situation, God. And if we can just find you, if we can just find your hope and your help, we too can win. But so much comes into our lives. For the people of Washington, Illinois, they understand that in so many real ways. And so do we. We have trials and struggles in our daily lives. Sometimes we like to act as if they aren't. Sometimes we like to act as if they're not significant. But we can't deny them. And they do influence us. Sometimes in our daily lives, we are tempted. Tempted to do the easy things. Tempted to do nothing, to skip a step. In this time of Lent, may we overcome any challenge or trial or temptation, that we will be intentional in our living, that we will grow in our faith, that we will understand Jesus more, and that we will be your people. So be with us in our day-to-day -day living. Help us to know your presence and grow us as your Lenten people to be your everyday people. May we keep our focus on you. This is our hope and our prayer this day. And we pray it in the name of your Son who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
that was beautiful, Sue. Can you believe she's not a pro? She's actually an elementary ed teacher. You could have another profession, maybe. Oh, there we go. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, but you only have verses 1 through 9 printed in the bulletin. This is my fault. I only gave the verses 1 through 9 to Anetta, so she printed what I told her. But we need those last two verses, so I have them written, it, um, written into mine. You'll just have to listen along when we get to those last two. You probably know them already anyway. A very famous passage about the temptation of Jesus. Let us hear the word. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him high on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. May God add blessing to the understanding and hearing of this word. Our Lenten theme is cross-eyed. Maybe you've seen the cover. I want to thank Elizabeth Bailey for creating this logo for us and Bill Froome for helping to create the words of the logo. Between the two of them, I think we have a pretty hip new kind of thing to look at. This will be our focus for these next few weeks being cross-eyed. We're not talking about the vision problem of being cross-eyed. I want you to understand that really clearly. What we're talking about is the spiritual gift of being cross-eyed, of looking to the cross, seeing that reflection in our eyes, that that can become something real for us throughout this whole time of Lent, that we can pay more attention to Jesus and his ministry and his teaching that we can renew ourselves to intentional living so that we can truly experience that time of hope and newness that comes at the end of this season. We are prepping ourselves to fully appreciate Easter. We can't get there too fast. We have to take the journey. The highs and the lows we will experience, especially in that last week, May your Lenten journey keep you focused. May you be cross-eyed during this time. All of our sermon titles will have something to do with vision, and today it is the stare-down. It is that stare-down between Jesus and the tempter. It is that stare-down between Jesus and Satan. Have you ever been in a stare-down? Have you ever been in a stare-down? Maybe you were eight or nine and you're having staring contests with your brother or your sister. Or maybe you had that driver that was just in front of you for way too long, doing way too many silly things, and as you pass by, you have that stare-down. <laughs> I have admitted already that I can be guilty of that. Another one that I can be guilty with is when I play basketball and I'm just out to have fun and not get hurt and then someone almost hurts me. I get up and I'm like, what are you doing? This isn't for a national championship. We watch those guys on TV. I can have a look. I know that. Sometimes it's not good. But sometimes 
in the face of difficulty, sometimes when we're being challenged to our core, sometimes when we need to build up our faith, sometimes when we need to defend it, we need to have the look. We need to be able to do what Jesus did, to stare back, to not falter, and to keep going down the path. Lent is kind of a stare down type of time because we will be tempted to not live in the right way. That's probably a year-round thing. But in this time when we're trying to be intentional, there will be things to crop up, to be a challenge, to keep us from right living. Stare back. Stare down that challenge. Be more like Jesus in his time of temptation. What's interesting about Jesus' time of temptation is that he had just come from a very big experience. Does anybody know? What happens right exactly before being swept away to the wilderness? Baptism. Jesus, literally, we go from one story to the next. Jesus is in that mountaintop experience of baptism. It's not on a mountain, it's in a river. And he's just gone to John the Baptist and he's been baptized, which is the beginning mark of his ministry. He is now prepared to go and do what he has been called to do, much like our own baptisms. When we go down into those waters and we rise up as new people to live in this world for God, Jesus was lucky. The clouds kind of separate. A dove comes down and there's a voice that everyone hears. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Wow. Don't you wish you could hear that every time you did something right and well? But Jesus got that. It had to be a mountaintop experience. He had to be on cloud nine. He had to be so jazzed, so excited, so ready. Just a moment, Jesus. Before you go and do all those things, I need you to do this. And he goes into the wilderness. You see, the mountaintop and the wilderness are totally different extremes. The wilderness experience comes from the idea of the Israelites having been released from slavery and spending 40 years wandering from that time to the promised land. 40 years of living in the desert, wondering where their food was coming from, wondering where their water was coming from. And let's be honest, they whined a lot. Moses, where's the water? Moses, I'm hungry. Where's the food? Poor Moses. But he endured, and so did the people. And they made their way. That's wilderness living. We experience wilderness living in a different way. We don't live in a desert. We're not wandering nomadic people for 40 years. But we know the desert. And in fact, maybe this Lenten time, it will be desert-like life for some of us as we try to get back in touch with our faith. So Jesus goes into the wilderness. And for 40 days, he doesn't eat or drink very much in the deserts. Can you imagine? Imagine. 40 days of fasting, trying to stay faithful. We don't do much fasting in our faith. It's not part of who we are. It's not part of the tradition that has been passed down to us. There are lots of traditions that do that, some Christian and some not. But that's not us. And so maybe we don't quite get what it is to deny ourselves some of that physical nourishment to find spiritual nourishment. But Jesus went through that for 40 days. And at the end of it, the tempter comes and says, are you hungry? See that, those stones right there? Just turn them into loaves of bread. You can do that, Jesus. And Jesus says, no. That's not what we're supposed to do. That's not how we live. We do not live by bread alone. There are more important things, O oh, tempter, O oh, devil, O oh, Satan. There are more important things. There's spiritual living. There's faithful living. That will nourish me enough. He had just come off his baptism. He had just spent 40 days fasting. Maybe he was in a good place. 
maybe he was able to do these things because he was in such a good place, but no matter, we're not sure, we're just told this happens. And so the tempter, not deterred, trying to get his own way, says, well, okay, if not that, come with me. Let's go way up to the top of the temple in the holy city, which means they went to Jerusalem. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never been swept up out of the wilderness up to the top of a building. I've never had that experience. We will never have that type of experience for we're not Jesus. The types of temptations that Jesus um, had to go through will not be ours. We will have more daily types of temptations. But Jesus is taken up to the top of this huge temple. And the tempter says, just fall. Just jump. Because it's written that you're going to be taken care of. You are going to be fine. Nothing will happen to you, oh Jesus. And Jesus says, no, we are not supposed to put God to the test. It's written. He always goes back to the tradition when answering this tempter. Going back to the word of God that had been passed down from his people. Generation after generation after generation. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So from that high point, Jesus and the tempter go to a new place. They go up to a high mountain. Look around, Jesus. Do you see all the kingdoms, all of those riches, all of those people? Those can be yours. You can be the supreme authority if You'll just bow down and worship me. And at this point, the stare down took a new turn. And instead of just trying to answer, Jesus says, get away. Go. Leave me. You don't understand. Love the Lord your God first and only. Serve God only. You want to stare down? the temptations in your life? You want to move through this season of Lent? Listen to those last words of Jesus in that third temptation. Love the Lord your God and serve only God. That will take you a long way in this world. It won't be the way that the world would have you go. We are going to be tempted to live in this world in different ways than what God and Jesus would instruct us to do. We're okay with being comfortable. We're okay with having the heat just right. And we're okay with, and I'm not saying that all of that's wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to tell you. We don't like the wilderness much. But sometimes we go through it to find faithful living. Use Lent as that. There's this some. Um, Thing called mindfulness it was in a Time article here recently called the Mindful Revolution. And mindfulness is this idea that the world is around you and you experience it one way. And most of the time you experience it, it's very unintentional. You're just going through your day. You're just going through your life. You're not thinking about things. You're not experiencing things as deeply as you could. The article starts with the author being in a class. This is being taught in colleges and universities around the country. And she's in a class. And she has a raisin. And she's holding the raisin and looking at the raisin. And understanding the raisin in new ways. And then she chews the raisin. And experiences it intentionally. And in doing so, appreciates the raisin. That may sound very silly to you. But get the concept. Get the idea of it. Change the raisin into a relationship. Whether with a spouse or with a friend or even a stranger who's walking down the street. If you're more intentional about being aware, mindful, of that person in your life? How will you experience them differently? 
I would say to you, have that be your relationship with God. If you are more intentional about your relationship with God, how will you experience that relationship differently? I had a chance to um, be trained a little by someone who is on the front end of this mindfulness generation. Her name is Dr. Maria Hunt. She used to be a teacher at Avila in um, Kansas City. She came to the school that Ann and I worked at, Christo Ray Kansas City High School. She was coming into this school that was 60% Hispanic and 35% African American. These kids who had um, very little intentional living taught to them, these kids who live day to day trying to figure out just getting through one day, just having enough to eat one day, just making the grade one day at a time. You see their lives changed in an instant depending on who got shot in their neighborhood the night before. Their lives changed in an instant depending on whose family got deported. Their lives changed in an instant depending on whose father got laid off. They couldn't see very far into the future. The goal of the school was to get everybody into college so each person who came to Christo Ray Kansas City High School, they knew that that was what their aim was. They knew that their goal was out there. But too often, too much got in the way. They couldn't stay focused. Dr. Hunt came to teach them. Part of mindfulness is meditation. Focusing on the here and now. Just allowing you to focus on your breath. That was a difficult thing for our kids. She came in, she turned off the lights, and she said, just breathe. Now pay attention to your breathing. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. When you breathe in, you were supposed to say just. And when you breathed out, you were supposed to say this. Just this. Just this. Trying to block out all that distracted you from your ultimate goal. That was the aim of mindfulness. Teaching those teenagers, things are going to come into your mind during this time. It's okay, don't be <coughs> mad, don't be upset. Don't just remind yourself that something got in the way. And then put it out of mind and focus on this moment, make it the best that it can be, so that you can reach your ultimate goal. Is that not Lent in a nutshell? We have an ultimate goal. But if we don't take care of this one moment right now, to the best of our ability, we may not reach that goal. Just this. Just this day. Just this day to grow in your faith. To answer that call from God. <laughs> to know you are connected. It's vital. There's a story about a temple that was built on an island. And when they built that temple, it had a thousand bells, all different shapes and sizes, made by the best craftsmen throughout the world. But as time went on, that island got swallowed up by the ocean. But the myth was that the bells continued to peal, to peal out, to ring out for those who could listen. The bells are underwater. A young man heard the story, and so he decided to travel thousands of miles so he could hear these glorious, beautiful, wonderful bells. And so he sat down at the edge of the sea and peered out into the direction where the island had been, and he sat there. But all he could hear was the lapping of the waves and the birds and the wind, and he kept trying to focus all of that out and stay very intent on hearing the bells. 
after a week of not hearing the bells, he was very discouraged. So he went back to the village and he listened to the tribal elders talk about those bells and how glorious they were. And if you could just only hear. And he got fired up again. And so he went down to the edge of the sand where the sea met. And he listened and he listened and he listened. And discouraged after another week, he gave up. He decided that maybe the myth wasn't really true or maybe it was just not in his destiny to hear those bells. So he went to the village and started to say his goodbyes and he came down to the ocean one more time and laid down, no longer sitting at the edge, peering towards the island, but just laying down to say goodbye to the sand and the sea and the sun and the trees and the animals. And in that moment, he began to hear the ocean. Instead of trying to put it out of focus, he focused in, and in that moment, the silence was deafening. And he became almost one with the sea. And in that moment, he heard it. One little bell, followed by another, followed by another, until all at once, all thousand bells were ringing, and he could hear it, and it was glorious and spectacular. He'd been focusing on one thing. But the bells were part of the ocean. May our focus be exactly where it needs to be this Lenten season. May our eyes be on the cross. May our ears be listening to the words of Jesus. May our hearts follow the lead of God. May it be so, my friends, my Lenten journey companions. May it be so for us. Amen. <coughs>
please be seated as we gather around this table on this <coughs> holy day. This is a good place for us to be on this first Sunday in Lent, for we can have a little vision checkup as we come to this table. We can get our sights set on the right path. We can truly become cross-eyed people of Jesus coming to this table, reminding ourselves that here we will be met, that here we will be given strength, that here we will be forgiven, that here we can find the love and friendship of God in new and surprising ways. So come and experience this table. Experience the one who invites you to this table. Shall we pray? Creator God, you have created a pure world and we have turned it into a toxic world. So much around us that seems attractive and appealing is destructive and dangerous. Help us to pass the temptation to eat the spiritual junk food. Help us realize that we are here now gathered. We are offered the bread of life. In this Lenten season, we realize how precious this bread is. Give us grace to take and eat it, share it with others. Through it, may we be bound together by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Father God, through you we pass from the shadow of death and into the light of resurrection. Give us hope as we rejoice in the gifts of the Spirit. Bless this cup and all who partake in it, for through this cup and this bread we are connected to you and your Son. Guide us through this season that we may not avoid struggle, but open ourselves to your blessing. Fill us with strength so that we may serve you well into everlasting life. Amen. Many chapters after the temptation story, Jesus will be at table with his disciples and he will take bread and he will bless it. And he will break it and give it to them saying, this is my body given for you. After the meal, he will take wine. He'll bless it. He'll pour it. And he will give it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me. Let us so remember the one we call Christ and Savior as we gather this day at this table.
Kelly and I saw the movie Son of God. In the movie, I was able to really see and, and understand the true kindness and acceptance that Jesus showed to all people. I also saw the persecution that Jesus experienced, similar to maybe what we see in today's society on TV or Facebook or even bullying in our schools. It's my hope that we see ourselves and our church as instruments of kindness. It is my hope that our programs here at First Christian are an extension of that grace and kindness that Jesus, Jesus demonstrated. It is through our offerings that our programs of grace and kindness can extend into the community and beyond. I would just ask us to keep this in mind um, and help us to be reminded of this as we collect our morning's offering. <coughs> closing hymn starts with this line, O oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. May that be a promise that we can make again this day. If anyone would like to come and be a part of First Christian Church, maybe part of your promise making is joining this congregation, it would be my pleasure and honor to meet you here at the front of the sanctuary and to um, share that time with you and this congregation. Let us all make promises.
Let us all rededicate our lives to going out and serving this week. Let us sing number 612, O Jesus, I have promised. this place. Stare down the challenges and temptations. Serve only God. May your vision be cross-eyed. In the name of the Christ. Amen.